Welcome to the Prophecy Club, where we study and research Bible prophecy. Our topic tonight is the top 13 Illuminati bloodlines. As prophecy students, we have all heard people say, well, they want to bring in a new world order. They want world government. They want world religion. They want the mark of the beast. Well, who is the they? Our speaker tonight is going to answer that question. Who is the they? Not only that, but their plans and how they plan to bring us into this global satanic conspiracy government, economy, and religion. Our speaker has, for the last six years, deprogrammed people from different mind control, top Illuminati people that were wanting to get out of it. He has deprogrammed, de debriefed, I should say, debriefed over uh, 24 different people. He's author of the top 13 bloodlines of the Illuminati, and also this book, The Illuminati Formula Used to Create an Undetectable, Total Controlled, Mind Controlled Slave, and 13 other books. Will you help me welcome Fritz Springmeyer. Before I get started with my talk, I <clears throat> have a few words to say. First, it's a great pleasure and a great privilege to be here with you. It's very important that you feel a part of what I have got to say tonight, because what I've got to say tonight is going to affect your life and your children's lives and the lives of future generations if there are any. I'm not trying to frighten anyone, but I do need to tell us about the situation, the dangerous situation that we are in today. Ladies and gentlemen, like you were told, I have co-authored with Cisco Wheeler two books on uh, the New World Order's mind control. And this small version here has a Japanese translation to it. <clears throat> Many of us Christians are not afraid to be thrown into prison because we realize that we are free in Christ no matter where we are. And they are the slaves. No matter where they are because they're slaves to sin. However, with today's sophisticated mind control technology, they have the ability to strip us of our own thoughts. We can no longer depend upon having a situation where our mind and our thoughts are our own. Now, <clears throat> I didn't write this book for myself, but I wrote this book, which uh, it, for sure is volume two. I wrote this book for the church so that they could come to the fullness and measure and stature of Christ and also for humanity. We are rapidly approaching a point in time where everybody who thinks is only going to be thinking what they are programmed. Now, you can uh, stay in denial and turn your back on humanity or you can read this book and then pass this information on to others. I want to get the word out, but I can't do it all by myself. I need your help. Getting this volume two book won't just help me, won't just help Prophecy Club, but will help humanity in general. And even the children can help. They can pray for those of us that are trying to get the message out. Now, I also need to warn you, <coughs> that this talk is not going to be politically correct. <laughs> but as a Christian in a nation where it's politically correct for 330 congressmen to write 20,000 bad checks over a period of three years, and as a Christian in a nation where it's politically correct for groups like Planned Parenthood to sue a high school in Florida, which is trying to teach abstinence insects to its unmarried 
high schoolers, while on the other side of the nation, in L.A., you have a school district which is beginning to think that there might be some relationship between their free condom program and their sex education class and the high rate of teenage pregnancy. So they do the politically correct thing. They offer a class in creative masturbation. As a Christian in a nation like this, I enjoy being politically correct just a notch below AIDS. Je uh, Admiral Stanfield Turner, in August of 1977, before a Senate committee, uh, revealed to this committee that, yes, the CIA was doing mind control on countless numbers of Americans who were, uh, and this was being done without their consent, and he even told some of the methods that they use, hypnosis, electroshock, drugs, this is a newspaper article from the time period, and here you see listed one of their programmers. Hey, Smack, what are your four answers? Yes, sir, no, sir, no excuse, sir. Sir, I do not understand. I entered West Point on July 3rd, 1973, and uh, was the first two months there are called beast barracks. That's where they tear you down and they build you into the soldier that they want you to be. Now, I knew there was something wrong about West Point, but it's taken me years to really get the full picture. But between my first and my second year, I went over to the Holy Lands, and it was right after the Yom Kippur War. And they had just won a tremendous victory, but they had won nothing. And for me, as a Christian, it really showed how ludicrous it was, how insane it was for us to fight these wars for the politicians. And it especially drove home the point that there are lots of men that will fight for the system, but there are only a few men that are willing to fight with that dedication in the Lord's army. So I took the lesson that I had learned at West Point, and that one lesson was obedience, and I decided to apply that to my Christian life. When somebody asked me to do something, when they gave me an order at West Point, I didn't ask, am I going to do this? But I, I simply responded, how am I going to do this? And so in my second year, I resigned from West Point with only one goal in my life, that was to serve Christ without reservation. Whatever your will is, Lord, I want to obey you like I have been taught to obey the army. And so it didn't matter what the Lord was going to tell me, how silly or how ridiculous it might be, I was going to do that. So when we start looking for the Lord, where do we go? <clears throat> well, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning was a symbol, and the symbol was with God, and the symbol was God. Symbols are very important. We use them to organize, to design, to communicate, to observe our world. Symbols are what elevate us above animals. And I think that in Satan's bag of tricks, just the manipulation of symbols alone is a tool that's capable of controlling mankind. This is a very interesting use of symbols. A friend of mine who worked for the New World Order, very high up in the New World Order, and he was one of their mind-controlled slaves. He had been part of the Illuminati. And one day, his photographic memory wrote down this formula. He said that the tetragrammaton, which is the symbol that stands for God, <coughs> equaled a formula for DNA. And I'm not saying it does or doesn't. I thought this was a very interesting use of symbols. My friend was to visit me on January 12th. On January 11th, 
he was murdered. So when we begin to look for God, where do we start? Well, if we decide that there's no God, we have placed ourselves in the position known as atheism or the same position that some Buddhists have placed themselves in. But if we decide that there are gods or a god, then we have another choice to make. Are there many gods or one god? If we decide that there are many gods, then th we have decided uh, to take the position known as polytheism, which is the same as Mormonism, the New Age movement, Greek and Roman mythology, Hinduism. But if we decide that there is one God, then we come down here and we can decide whether he is identified with the universe or whether he is distinct from the universe. If we say that he is identified with the universe, we have taken the position known as pantheism and panentheism, which is uh, Zen Buddhism and Christian science. But if we say that he is distinct from the universe, <coughs> then we have a choice. Is he finite or infinite? <coughs> if he is finite, then we have placed ourselves in the position that the Watchtower Society of the Jehovah's Witnesses took. There is a little known doctrine that they promulgated the first half of their history, and most Jehovah's Witnesses are not aware of it, but the leadership that they have today, which is old, was around when they promulgated this doctrine, and they haven't repudiated it, so we have to assume that they still hold to it. And that doctrine was that God was a finite being, like you or I, and he lived in the star constellation, the Pleiades. You've heard of Pleiadians. And he, this was specifically on the star Alcyon, and he sent messages to the governing body of the Watchtower Society from Alcyon, and it took eight days. But if we say that God is infinite, then we come down here and ma can make the choice <coughs> that he never does miracles or he sometimes does miracles. If he never does miracles, that's what's known as deism. The rational thinkers of the 1700s thought that way, like Thomas Jefferson. However, a lot of those men were closet occultists. But then we can also decide that he sometimes does miracles, and this is places us into this uh, category known as theism, which is uh, typified by the faith of Abraham and many of the types of your mainstream monotheistic religions. So how do we know what's truth? If we go back to the beginning, we will find out that w there were two sources of truth. There was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there was the tree of life in the garden. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil includes worldly knowledge of what is right and wrong. It's the letter of the law of God. And the dead religion based on compliance to the dead letter of the law. It's man-made compliance to law and man-made changes in outward behavior. It's a focus on self. If we focus on ourself, we can go two directions. We can indulge and become licentious, or we can go the other route, which is a problem in some churches. We can become self-righteous. It also includes a false trust that worldly philosophy and other fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will expose Satan. It will not expose Satan. Why? Because Satan appears as an angel of light. Remember how much we have placed in the basket as it was passed around? Satan was willing to give Christ the entire world on the mountaintop. How's that for a donation? The fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil will not expose Satan. This is what is called in scripture the flesh. It leads to death, not to mention also producing in the mind lasciviousness, double-mindedness, and pride in what one knows. It's the goodness of man, and it's very popular. But the other tree in the garden, it included a fear of God, peace, 
God-centered knowledge, which is relevant to what God is doing, therefore wisdom. It's the spirit of the law, a living faith in a relationship with Yahweh God. Its spirit made changes in the heart. It focuses on Christ, the spirit, and the heavenly father. It exposes Satan and his influences by correctly using the living word of God written by the spirit along with the guidance of the spirit. It's what the scriptures call the spirit. It leads to life, not to mention a renewed sound mind and humility to learn from others and from the master teacher. It's the goodness of God. And it's very unpopular because a natural man doesn't receive the things of God because they're foolishness to him. But there was a problem. Satan came into the garden and brought evil. And this has produced a logic problem. For here we have a God who's omniscient, all-knowing, and a God that's omnipotent, almighty, and yet he's, we're told that he's holy good, and yet something that this holy good, all-knowing, uh, all-powerful God, something that he has created, has evil in it. Now, this problem has faced all of us on a subconscious or a conscious level. In fact, it was such a problem with philosophers in the 1940s that a number of them began, it, began writing books and phil uh, philosophical systems. They were writing books to expose Christianity and other religions as being illogical, especially because of this logic problem. One of these men uh, lived in Boston, and uh, he worked for decades writing a book exposing the illogic of uh, Christianity because of this logic problem. In the early 1960s, he realized that his philosophical system had the same logic problem. In fact, even though he didn't become a Christian, he realized that the Bible had a lot to tell us. And so he spent the next decade writing a book explaining how much Christianity did have to offer. But a lot of us, we go to our clergymen and we ask them about this problem of evil and we're given insufficient answers. We're told, just have faith. Or we're told, there's no contradiction. Or you know, the answer is so smooth, but by the time they're finished, all these terms are devoid of their usual meanings and are vague. Or perhaps it's declared to us that we only see through a glass darkly. These insufficient answers leave many reasonable persons deeply disturbed by the absurdity of conventional belief in God. Some have decided that human life is self-defeating, tragic, and absurd. There's better answers. But you may be wondering, why is Fritz focusing on this? When time is so short in this talk, and we all know that there's a problem with evil, and we all deal with this logic problem. Well, the reason why is because the good Lord called me to do three things. First, expose evil, then give hope, and then call people back to the word of God. If you have a prophetic ministry, it's very easy, if you don't expose evil, to give flippin' hope. Oh, just vote the characters out of office, see? But on the other side, it's very easy to expose evil and then walk away without giving people hope. But if you're doing like I'm trying to do, to expose evil to the very depths of evil, is very hard to give people hope. So this is very important to our discussion today. There are better answers. For instance, to show that every mathematical, scientific, and philosophical system has vagueness and contradictions within their principles. Philosophers cannot define and defend their own criteria of meaning without employing self-defeating arguments. All philosophy and mathematical systems have paradoxes when one pushes to get total clarity of terms. One has to either accept A 
some vagueness of terms, or B, accept paradox with extremely clear terms. Next, common sense of human existence means we must accept the contradictions that accompany the complexity of the sense and nonsense of our spiritual environment. Life is full of nonsense. If you try to write a computer program to decide whether somebody loved you and they squeeze your toothpaste from the middle of the tube and the computer program kicks it out that they don't love you. Life is full of a lot of nonsense. It can't be broken down into logic. The problem of evil is actually a sign that reveals that there are deep issues of life that must be plumbed, like a crack in the Earth's crust that plunges out of sight. Now, people, evil is not out of control. God has said, I will establish a point in time here that I'll allow evil to begin, and evil can continue until this point in time. And then he showed us that in between these two points, all evil can be turned to good, and the proof of that is the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. God can view evil in a different view because he is above time and knows that with his unlimited power, all things will work for good to them that love God. God has unlimited power to bring something good out of evil. Proof of this ability is the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. In order to bring true love into human existence, God had to allow choice, which includes the choice of rejection and disobedience by his creation. After a period of allowing mankind to choose to love him, God promises to destroy evil. But there was another thing that sin brought. We're talking about trauma. As I started to work with these people under Illuminati mind control, this mind control is often called trauma-based mind control. I realized that what was being done on a very intense scale was actually being done on a looser scale to all of us. We're traumatized, and we're traumatized for a reason, to program us a lie. It's very important we catch on to this. First, a trauma is applied. Second, a lie is offered, which when accepted alleviates or improves the pain of the trauma. And third, systems of lies are built to trap us within the confines of the lies we believe in. For instance, imagine we're uh, thousands of years ago in India, and uh, be, uh, we are traumatized, and because this is demonic-based, the lie has told us, if you worship this phallus, this lingam, why, your pain will be alleviated. And we do. And because the, this is all demonic-based, why we have some alleviation of the pain. And then our culture is, makes this a tradition, and we are all trapped into the lie. Now, here's another example. A Christian's life is cut short by Satan. The lie that is offered the survivors is God owes every person a full, happy, prosperous 70 to 80 year life. God is then blamed. Why did God let this happen? The resulting bitterness opens up a door for a person to get into immorality, which further entraps the person. The reality is, if God gave us what we deserved, in our weak, sinful nature, none of us would be alive because mankind is in rebellion to God, their creator. People need to focus on what they have received from God, not what we haven't received. To focus on what wasn't given rather than the great gifts that have been given is ungratefulness. Therefore, when a trauma is applied to our life, we can use that trauma to program a lie into our life or we can grow spiritually by seeing the deeper spiritual realities that the trauma is trying to teach us. And again, recapping all of this, Christ's life is proof that God has the ability to turn evil into good. And God has told us that he will use suffering to take our eyes off of trivial things so that we can see deeper et uh, eternal realities. It, uh, he also tells us that uh, suffering will develop our faith, virtue, knowledge, 
self-control, endurance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. As we are taught in 1 Peter, but the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And we are also receiving suffering to prove that we're a royal priesthood. And here is Apostle Paul, and he's talking to the philosophers of his day at the Areopolis, and he's going idols, idols everywhere, even an idol to an unknown God. And here he is again with the Acropolis in the background, talking to the philosophers of his day. I've come to tell you about an unknown God, and if you want to read what Paul taught, told the philosophers of the ancient world, read in Acts 17. Now we talked about the Spirit of God leading us into all truth, the tree of life. And the Spirit revealed this to me, and then he confirmed that by giving the same revelation to other brothers, who uh, then I subsequently met. This is how paradise runs, or how it's sustained. We're looking at the real before we look at the counterfeit. <clears throat> it's very interesting. The Spirit revealed that God's attributes themselves are what sustain paradise. And if we look at how we define God or what God is, we find that those are the elements that make up the New Jerusalem. Now, the basic structure of paradise is a cube. And this has some inherent uh, attributes to it. For instance, it's stable. On the bottom, uh, we find true love. Now, I might interject here. I'm not teaching this as a new doctrine. I'm just presenting it to you so that, to help you picture or understand how things work. On the top is God's order, authority and authority covering. And then we find on the rest of the cube, justice, truth, equity, and life. And there are books that could be written about this revelation, but we are just briefly covering it. <clears throat> In contrast with this, this is the world system that Satan has set up. And it's a double pyramid structure. This was, again, given to me by revelation of God, and again, it was confirmed by other brothers who received similar revelation. But what was very interesting was confirmation from an unexpected source. That was Norman Dodd. Norman Dodd was the chief investigator of the Reese Committee in 1953. Congress established the Reese Committee to investigate the un-American activities of the foundations. Norman Dodd had lived and worked around the movers and shakers of the world his entire life. He was a banker, amongst other things. And these movers and shakers, many of them Illuminati, they thought that Norman Dodd was one of them. So they freely talked to him. But at one point, after having rubbed shoulders with them for years, he realized how they were running the world. And he put together this model, and he showed it to Alexander Sox, one of the most powerful men at that time in the nation, and Alexander Salk said, I can't w stay here in the room and listen to you explain this if you want to be alive. That's how right on it was. There are six elements to this world system. Order, represented by the state, wisdom, values, justice, the courts, truth, the church, wealth, the prices, and equity, the market. And I've added to what Norman Dodd had as just wealth, I've added health on there as a function of that. This is a double pyramid. It has some intrinsic things to it, too. The base supports the top. And uh, you have a mirror image on the bottom. You will also find that uh, the cube shape is talked about in Scripture as being the structure of paradise. It's the shape that the New Jerusalem is in. It's the shape that the Holy of Holies is in. And we are also told in Matthew that we are the salt of the earth and a salt crystal is the shape of a cube. Likewise, there's some scriptures that talk about this shape uh, being a, a satanic shape. And 
Interestingly, too, there are some scriptures that use the word stoichia in them, approximately six of these, and Bible scholars have been scratching their heads wondering, what does stoichia mean? If we go back to the classical Greek, we will see that they use the word to mean elements that make up something, that comprise something. I believe that when the scriptures warn us not to be deceived by the elements of the world, that they're referring to these elements, even though they're not spelled out. And originally when I had put together this talk, I was going to go in and show how each of these different elements of the world system was controlled by the Illuminati. But this, is, this talk doesn't have that much time. So we are only going to briefly talk about some of these things. But I want you to be aware that there is information that will show how each of these elements are controlled. Now this next diagram is extremely important to our discussion today. And it will, be, it will tie in with a lot of things that we say as we go through our discussion. And this is the way Satan creates a Gnostic religion. There are three components to a Gnostic religion. I discovered this reading in an obscure Gnostic book in an obscure paragraph. And all of a sudden I realized they've just told me how they do it. Remember back in the Garden of Eden, they, uh, Satan said, this knowledge will save you. That's saving, saving knowledge. That's Gnosticism. Okay? So then the next step was, is they realized knowledge is power. And they realized that if you say, I have hidden knowledge, people have to come to you for that hidden knowledge. You create an instant power base. So the first, first element that Satan uses in setting up a Gnostic religion is hidden knowledge. <clears throat> now the next thing is you can't give away all your hidden knowledge at once or you've just given away your power base. So you have to dish it out in increments. If you're a Mason, you receive it incrementally as you go through an initiate degree system. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you receive it incrementally by staying in touch with, and this is a direct quote, God's channel of communication. You incrementally receive Watchtower and Awake magazines. Or if you're in some Pentecostal churches that make you dependent upon this prophet who has revelation knowledge that no one else can give you, then uh, that's another example of how this hidden knowledge makes you dependent upon a religious system. Now the next criteria, the next uh, thing that they use in setting up a Gnostic religion is that you can't get the devotion from the common masses that you can from an initiate group. So you set up two different religions. You set up one for the broad masses and one for the initiates. And then you establish a cover ruling body and then at the top the key men are Satanists. So let's uh, take the Jehovah's Witnesses, for example. There we've got the great crowd who are promised life on earth. And then we've got the anointed, promised heaven, and then their governing body, and then their key men. In 1991, I came out with a reference book, Be Wise as Serpents, which was 800 pages, sort of like a Young's Concordance of the New World Order. And I tried to go through many different groups and show how they had been created and how they were being manipulated and controlled. And, for instance, with the Jehovah's Witnesses, here up at the top, we've got a man named Nathir Salih. He was an Iraqi Jew, who, and he loves nice, expensive jewelry. And the president of the Watchtower Society, the late one, Freddie Franz, recently died, for many years, for many decades, had been on his deathbed. And he was considered to be the leader of the Watchtower Society. Nobody even knew about Nathir Salih. But whenever there needed to be a decision by this man on his deathbed who died at 99, Nathir Salih would go into his room and come out with the answer. Now, another man that was um, uh, ties in with this 
is um, someone who's on the governing body who's a Rhodes Scholar. In fact, Freddie Franz was offered to be a Rhodes Scholar, but turned it down so that he would be in a position to take over the Watchtower Society. Now, if we take this structure with its three components that I've just outlined to you, and we turn it on its side, this pyramid structure on its side, we come up with something that looks like a pie. Now, think about this. Here on the outside, we've got like a Catholic and a Mormon and a Jehovah's Witness. This is the perfect control mechanism. The Catholic out here is fighting the Mormon, is fighting the Jehovah's Witness, is fighting somebody else. None of them ever rebel against the sinner. Very few of them ever realize they're being controlled by the sinner. If they ever do rebel against the sinner, they are stopped by the initiate group, the clergy. For instance, in the Catholic Church, your broad masses would be your laity, and your initiate group would be your clergy, and then your cardinals would be your covering, cover ruling body, and then your key men would be Satanists. Or within your Mormons, you would have your Melchizedek priesthood, and your, or your Aaronic priesthood, your Melchizedek priesthood, and then your 70 and whatnot at LDS headquarters, and then your key men there. So uh, some of these of the priesthood that are, are being a buffer to protect the, the sinner, some of them are actually going to believe in the religion, and some of them are just going to be in it because that's how they make a living. But at any rate, it's the perfect protection for the sinner. And these people in the sinner all know each other. They are your Illuminati. And Satan knows when you go to a restaurant, you like a variety. So all of these groups are patterned on that, that pie-shaped thing that I just gave you, that pyramid. And my apologies to Baskin Robbins, there's more than 31 flavors there. <laughs> and this is just showing you, I want, I want to briefly mention one other thing about this uh, diagram here. These boundaries between the different pieces of pie are artificial boundaries. Satan can pull those out anytime he wants, and we see glimpses of that every now and then like at the World Car Parliament of Religion, where Hindus and Buddhists and Indian shamans and Satanists and Chuck Colson, representing the Protestants, got together and prayed. And as a little bit of a tidbit of, that, of what I'm saying, this is a Jewish father who's bringing Mary worship to the Jews. But the pyramid structure is too easy for people to see, so they've taken the deception to another height. They've created what's called the spin principle, segmented polycentric integrated network. This is dim uh, and here the spin principle is demonstrated by New Age teaching institutions. What you do is, is you set up many little what look like grassroots organizations. They're all spinning the same direction. And then if somebody tries to take one down, all they get is one little node and the network remains. And here's another example of the spin principle. This is by New Age groups. And this next transparency no longer applies since about 1950 because they are merging all the religions together. But originally the Illuminati worked behind front. Satan's empire's like an onion with layer after layer. And you have to peel it back. So the Illuminati uh, created and worked behind groups, mystical groups, which then in turn controlled and worked behind monotheistic groups. So Freemasonry behind Protestantism, Jesuits behind Roman Catholics, Frankists behind the Jews, Sufis behind the uh, Islam. Now we're going to go through these next transparencies very quick, very quickly. Uh, they are part of a document packet I put together in 1990 and had for a while, but and, um, after offering them for a couple years, I think I got like one person who requested one. They're showing from their primary documents what they are trying to do. And here in this document, Manley Palmer Hall tells us that a secret governing body controls the globe, not the various religious governing bodies that pretend to rule. 
That's what I was trying to tell you with that diagram with the black uh, circle in the middle of the pie. And who is Manley P. Hall? Manley P. Hall was a grandmaster in the Illuminati, and he was also a grandmaster in Freemasonry. And here is the Scottish Rite Journal, journal's obituary of him, illustrious Manley Palmer Hall, often called Masonry's greatest philosopher. Now, this is from Alice Bailey. She wrote The Externalization of the Hierarchy. And she was head <coughs> of Lucius Trust. <coughs> and Lucius Trust, as so many of you already know, is a publishing company. Uh, uh, Lucius Publishing is a publishing company for the United Nations. And uh, it was originally known as Lucifer Publishing and Lucifer Trust. And Alice Bailey created 140 New Age religions. And she worked for the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare in 1957, establishing educational goals that are now being implemented in the United States. For instance, Global 2000. And she, and she writes that... Freemasonry will be the reli uh, universal religion. Other uh, New Age leaders, like Benjamin Krim, also say the same thing, that Freemasonry will be the a new universal religion. And she says that between the church and esoteric groups and Freemasonry, there is no disassociation between all of these. <clears throat> this is just simply to show you that... Uh, the next quotes are coming to you on the basis of the highest Masonic authority. This is um, ancient mystic oriental masonry written by Clymer, a high-ranking Freemason. <clears throat> and he tells us that masonry is connected to the ancient systems of priesthood. And he lists the different ancient systems of priesthood of the mystery religions. <clears throat> and he tells us that the Celts and the Brahmins and others, Ahura Mazda in Persia, and, and even the uh, Pharisees, your Levites, Curitas, Magi, Brahmins, Druids, they were connected by secret ties and intercommunicated from the Indus to the Tiber, from the Nile to the Thames, hence there ever has been, is, and ever will be Freemasonry on our planet. What he's talking about is that inner black circle I was talking to you about. In the ancient world, there were many mystery religions, and each of those mystery religions had their councils. But men from those councils got together in a supra council, council <clears throat> that controlled it all, and that was the Illuminati. Now, a lot of you have never probably heard, heard much about that term before, so let's talk a minute about what the Illuminati is, what the word means. The mystery religions only went underground for a long period of time. But they all, the priesthood always continued. You can't find any point in history where they were ex extinguished. And in 1776, they reorganized themselves as the Illuminati. <clears throat> the Illuminati is the continuation of the mystery religion. As an example of that, when I met the Illuminati Grand Master, and now he's an Ipsimus in the Illuminati, in our Northwest area, shook his hand. He had a ring on his finger, and if you go to Manley P. Hall's book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, on page C, which is 100, you'll find that he says that a silver ring with a snake swallowing its tail it indicates rank in the mystery religions, and this Grand Master had a ring exactly like that. <clears throat> and here is uh, from Clymer's book again, and it says, So broad is the religion of masonry, and so carefully all sectarian tenets excluded from the system, that the Christian, the Jew, and the Mohammedan, and all their numberless sects and divisions may and do harmoniously combine in its moral and intellectual work with the Buddhist, the Parsi, the Confucian, and the worshiper of deity under every form. That's also, a direct quote from Mackey's Masonic Jurisprudence, so you have two 
Masonic authorities that are telling you the same thing, that Freemasonry is a universal religion. And here is Clymer again, and he says, Masonry was founded on the ancient wisdom religion, and when founded, was not known as Freemasonry. And here is something from Morals and Dogma. When you become a 32nd degree Freemason, they give you Morals and Dogma to read and, and to carry around. And, and if you uh, read in there, you will find that Albert Pike, who was the head of all Freemasonry in his day and known as the Pope of Freemasonry, says, Masonry is identical with the ancient mysteries. And this is from the Masonic House of the Temple in Washington, D.C., the Scottish Rites House of the Temple. And there's another room in this building, which is a 14 by 25 room with 13 chairs, where the Grand Druid Council of the Illuminati meets. And here's from another Freemason, high ranking, Foster Bailey. And he says, little as it may be realized by the unthinking Mason who is interested only in the outer aspects of the craftwork, the whole fabric of Masonry may be regarded as an externalization of that inner spiritual group whose members down the ages have been custodians of the plan and as those to whom has been committed the working out of the will of God for the race of men. They assist at the unfolding of the consciousness of the candidate until the time comes when he can enter into light and in his turn become a light bearer, one of the Illuminati who can assist the Lodge on high in bringing humanity to light. So he's telling us here that if you are uh, selected as a Freemason, you may be able to go on and be one of the Illuminati. Here are a few of our presidents who were Freemasons in their Masonic garb. George Washington, Andrew Johnson, and you see William McKinley there, and William Taft and Theodore Roosevelt, and FDR, and Truman, and Ronald Reagan. And here's Alice Bailey again in her externalization of the hierarchy. And she tells us that in place of Christi Christianity, the mystery of religions will be restored by the church and Freemasonry. And Manly P. Hall tells us, the genuine esoteric associations always required that disciples prepare themselves for careers of practical service. The student was expected to attain a state of unusual skill or proficiency in some branch of learning. He was then to practice this profession or craft as a, mat, as a means of extending his fear of constructive influence. He was to teach through example, enriching his chosen vocation with the overtones of enlightened religious philosophy, thus gradually creating a significant zone of influence. He was available for whatever task the keepers of the great plan required. So if you're a member of a group like Freemasonry, they want you to work towards this goal of one world government and the new age the, that they call the great plan. And Alice Bailey tells us how they're going to do this. She says, by means of the educational work of the world, the great Lord, who she refers to in this book as Lucifer, seeks to reach those of the intelligent public who cannot be reached by means of ceremonial and symbolism as in masonry or by religious means and rituals as in the church. It touches the masses and those in whom the intelligent aspects predominate. What she's telling us here is, and we'll read it again in this next one, is the three main channels through which the preparation for the New Age is going on might be regarded as the church, the Masonic fraternity, and the educational field. We're going to get them in the churches to, uh, to bring in this New Age, but not everybody goes to church. So we'll teach them in the fraternities, but not everybody goes to a Masonic lodge. So then the safety net for it all is education. We're in a period is of what is called externalization of the hierarchy. They're taking what was done in secret a uh, hundred years ago and they're externalizing what was done by the hierarchy in secret into society. So that's why when I go down the street and I get a meal at a fast food place. Here is a wizard doing magic with Lilith, the owl, and throwing energy balls on my hamburger sack. And then I go down the street, and 
here's an identical looking wizard and fire and ice, which are important symbols in the occult. And then I go to the na next fast food place, and this is their placemat, and it blows me away. How to hypnotize your parents. And then I go on to the library, and they're handing this out as you go through the door, Metaphysics for Our Age. And I look inside the library book, and they have the symbol for the Illuminati, a snake swallowing its tail, and it says Illumino. And then I find out that it's Freemasons running our libraries and our school system. And I go to the laundromat, and here's a lady who's channeling demons, and she's going to teach how to use your spiritual energy, and she's teaching this in the Portland Masonic Temple. And I come home and I think, well, it's safe to read the food section in the paper at least. <laughs> and here's a witch teaching witchcraft in the food section. Now, I told you that they're going to use education to bring in the externalization of the hierarchy. My wife is taught in a public school, and this public school for the last 15 years has had nothing to do with Christmas. They have an occult ritual uh, winter solstice program during that time period. And in 1991, this was the program that they gave the parents who came to a meeting like this to watch their children put on the play. And they celebrated the return of Lucifer. And inside, this is the program. And the children on stage, some of them had acceptable barcodes on their foreheads, and some of them had unacceptable barcodes on their foreheads. And by the way, I happened to send this uh, um, one day to Tex Mars, and he put it on the front of his newsletter. Now, getting back to Alice Bailey, she says, the Masonic movement will meet the need of those who can and should well power as the custodian of the law, as the home of the mysteries, and the seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity and the way of salvation is pictorially preserved in its work. The methods of deity are demonstrated in its temples, and under the all-seeing eye, the work can go forward. It is a far more occult organization than can be realized and is intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultists. In its ceremonials lies hid the welding of the forces connected with the growth and life of the kingdoms of nature and the unfoldment of the divine aspects of man. If you're an Illuminati uh, boy, the Illuminati wants you to go through Freemasonry to learn the outer symbols of the mystery religions. But the real hardcore rituals of the mystery religions are reserved for Illuminati rituals or some of the higher rites of Freemasonry. This is a cover of one of the Scottish Rites magazines. The Supreme Council 33rd Degree, their official magazine, has been known as the New Age magazine for 100 years. They've been promoting the New Age movement for a long time. In the 70s and 80s, Christians were still debating whether there was a New Age movement. And in the inside of this magazine is a page which has a very interesting quote. As stated before, God's plan in America is a non-sectarian plan. Our Constitution is non-sectarian. Our great American public schools, God's chosen schools, are non-sectarian. The great spirit behind the great nation is non-sectarian. Our great American public schools have never taken away from any child the freedom of will, freedom of spirit, or freedom of mind. That is the divine reason that great God, our King, has chosen the great American public schools to pave the way for the new race, the new religion, and the new civilization that is taking place in America. Any mother or father or guardian who is responsible for the taking away of freedom of mind, freedom of will, or freedom of spirit is the lowest criminal on this earth because they take away from that child the God-given right to become part of God's great plan in America for the dawn of the new age of the world. They're saying, shame on you, Christian parents, for sending your kids to Christian school. You are the lowest criminal on earth. And here is Lucius Trust, um, just a letter from them indicating that their triangles groups are in 110 countries. This is from another Masonic magazine. It says, Masonry's greatness is not in the antiquity 
of its beginnings, neither in its conservatism, but rather in the fact that it has always been a leader of thought and action. I repeat, a comprehensive understanding of the history of Masonry leads inevitably to the conclusion that not through conservatism has it most served the world, but rather through its spirit of unrest, its utter abhorrence of unnecessary restraint, its abiding love for liberty, its unconquerable desire to progress away from the old to the new and better conditions. Wherever the conflict has been waged between the old and the new, between a narrow conservatism and real progress, our Masonic brethren have been found on the right side, witness the members of St. Andrew's Lodge of the Green Dragon who threw the tea into Boston Harbor. I wish I had a dollar for every time that I have been, I, I have heard someone talk about the Boston Tea Party being a tax revolt against high taxes. What actually happened? British Parliament drastically slashed taxes. So why would people revolt against that? Well, the people didn't. But the Masons at that time period were smuggling uh, opium into this country in the bottom of ships. They are also smuggling in tea. And when British Parliament drastically cut import taxes, it made their, their illegal tea uncompetitive with the legal tea. And they were upset that this was going to cut into their profits. So when they were going to have their lodge meeting that night at the Green Dragon Inn, and you might remember that name for later on it might come up, they decided, and if you look in the minutes of their lodge meeting, you'll see that they decided to cancel their meeting that night and they, dis they planned to dress up in, as Indians, and then they went down to Boston Harbor, and there was this poor captain who was at the wrong place at the wrong time, and they dumped millions of dollars of his, however much it was, of his tea right into Boston Harbor. It was a criminal act, and now history has been tweaked a little bit, and we see them as great patriots. <coughs> <coughs> this was from a map that I did and just showing Masonic lodges during the revolutionary time period. The Freemasons were the ones who planned and carried out a large share of the American Revolution <coughs> and uh, 33 of the 35 signers of the Declaration were Freemasons. There are over 800 <coughs> fraternal organizations in this nation Essentially, all of them has start, been started by the Freemasons. Many religious groups and religions have been started by the Freemasons. And if we look at this Scottish Rite Journal page, we see that they say Freemasonry as a world power. And they see this in 1921 when this was written, um, that there was a struggle between Freemasonry and the Catholic Church. This was one of those many controlled struggles that the uh, Illuminati has given us. Well, it's no longer that situation anymore. In 1993, in one of my newsletters, I uh, listed hundreds of top Vatican officials and their initiation dates and their secret Masonic member no membership numbers. This is just a small section of the list. And here's the Catholic Church with the Illuminati all-seeing eye in it. <clears throat> now there are a number of top 13 families. You've got Astor, Bundy, Collins, DuPont, Freeman, Kennedy, Lee, Onassis. Now Reynolds is not one of the top 13, but it's close up there. Rockefeller, Rothschild, Russell, and then you've got your 13th Illuminati bloodline, which is the Merovingian bloodline, which believes that they are descendants of Christ and descendants of Lucifer in the house of David. And uh, you've got the Van Dyne family. So these are your top Illuminati families. Now, we're going to take a break from getting an overview of things and we're going to focus in on just one little time point in history, the Civil War, and we're going to look at three men at that time period. This is so that we can see how the small relates to the big. 
we're going to look at Abraham Lincoln, Ulysses Grant, and John Brown. John Brown was an abolitionist who um, tried to arm the slaves and by doing so provoked the South to want to have an armed rebellion. Abraham Lincoln ran on an anti-slavery platform and his election provoked the South to secede and Ulysses S. Grant was Lincoln's best general and the greatest Civil War a hero. <clears throat> now, the Illuminati wanted to create an American Civil War. The United States was getting too big and too rich, so they wanted to divide and conquer. And they wanted to bring us into debt and create a national bank. And they were also looking forward to all the war profits that they were going to get, running drugs and munitions and other things, but they needed people to implement their plan. And we're only going to look at three people, and of those we can only give, due to time, a fraction of what could be said. So let's look at the first person. Let's, uh, let's look at John Brown. <clears throat> John Brown was a Rosicrucian and a Mason, and so was his father. Now, there was a Rosicrucian named William Lloyd Garrison, and he created the Anti-Slavery Society in 1832. He also um, became a member of the Order of the Rose in England in 1834. There was another Rosicrucian, uh, George Lippard, who was a member of the Brethren of Light, and it was he who taught John ba Brown to be rabidly anti-slavery. Now, John Brown didn't know much about the scriptures, but he was traveling through a Mormon settlement, which ties into all of this, but we can't go into it, and they taught him their blood atonement doctrine, where you pay for the sin with your own blood, and so he thought in his warped mind that if somebody sinned or he did something he didn't like, that gave them him the right to blow them away with a shotgun for the wages of sin is death. John Brown was a murderer, and so was his sons. But he was a common man. He only became what he became because he had a conspiracy behind him. Now, there was a club, the Berg Club, that met in Young's Hotel in Boston, Massachusetts. And one of the members of the Berg Club, Senator Charles Sumner, went over to Europe and visited with leading Illuminati kingpins. For instance, Giuseppe Mazzini. And he came back then and, <clears throat> and got the Berg Club organized into a group to a conspiracy to arm John Brown. Uh, several of the members of the Berg Club were Unitarian pastors who appeared uh, as pacifists while they were sending supplies and guns to John Brown. For instance, we had Unitarian Reverend Higginson and Unitarian Reverend Parker. And then there was Unitarian George Stearns, who manufactured lead pipe. If you know how poisonous water is when it's put through lead pipe. And then there was Garrett Smith, who was an Illuminati multimillionaire, whose father was best associate with John Jacob Astor the first, another Illuminati kingpin. And then they not only set up this secret group to help John Brown, but they, uh, they pulled their establishment media in line, and so groups like, papers like the New York Times, who had Karl Marx as their correspondent, uh, built John Brown up into a hero. And they sent over a professional revolutionist, a Jewish Freemason named Amshel Bondi, who uh, helped John Brown in places like Bleeding Kansas, and when he was done, then went over into other places in the world to help with other Masonic-inspired uh, revolutions. Now let's look at Ulysses Grant. Ulysses S. Grant was born and named Hiram Grant. He was named after the Masonic sun god Hiram Abiff, and his father was a master mason and the leader of a lodge. His father's name was Jesse Root Grant, where we heard the Root name. Remember Eliah Root and Colonel House? Jesse Root Grant 
worked for John Brown's father. And when he quit working for John Brown's father, he started working for E.A. Collins. Well, who are the Collins family? The Collins family is one of the top 13 Illuminati bloodlines. Remember the Pilgrims? The Pilgrims are one of the Puritan groups that came over to New England. When the Puritans came over, there are groups of witches that came over with them. Francis Collins, who came over with one of the early groups of Puritans, was a witch. These witches came over. Now remember, in New England, the state supported the churches. They taxed the people and then gave money to the churches. So it was advantageous to be an establishment state-sponsored church. So the churches that the witches set up and belonged to, they called themselves the same names as the Puritan churches, which was Congregational and Presbyterian. But after the Civil War, around 1824, the state quit giving these churches money, and so it, be, it no longer was advantageous to continue the name, and so the witches uh, created the Unitarian Church, or one of the Collins started the Unitarian Church, which in turn started Yale and Harvard. And there were Illuminati secret societies at Yale before they brought in the Order of the Skull and Bones. Now an example of a, a Unitarian minister who is also Illuminati is Karl Follen. He created their Bund der Jugend in Europe, and he, uh, which was Illuminati Front, which also operated behind another Illuminati Front, the Swiss Bible Society. But when things got too hot, he came over to Harvard and taught as a Unitarian minister. There was another um, man that was active, uh, noteworthy to note, James Anderson Collins. He was also busy working with Unitarians, Rosicrucians, Masons, and Socialists to create a civil war. Now, the Collins family in the 1700s branched into the Todd family, and they also branched into the Putnam Putnam families, and they also branched into the Grant family, which then branched into the Wheeler family. Now to show you that there is a connection between the, uh, uh, the Civil War and the present time period, if we look at Grant was the top military man uh, of his day, and then his in the Civil War, and then during the Vietnam era, his descendant, General Earl Grant Wheeler, was head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the United States. Now, General Earl Grant Wheeler was a member of the Illuminati, and he was also a member of the Collins family via the Grant Ulysses Grant bloodline. And General Earl Grant Wheeler had a brother named Ulysses Grant Wheeler, who had a son who was born on the day after the Illuminati high climax ritual, and that son was named Leo Wheeler, and Leo Wheeler became a grandmaster in the Illuminati. Now, uh, the Vietnam War was created by the Illuminati to create a drug culture in the United States. They moved the American boys over to a country where there was for, uh, lots of a easy access to lots of drugs and got a lot of American boys hooked on drugs. But they also smuggled drugs into the United States, and the Army was in full cooperation, parts of it, uh, with the Illuminati drug smuggling. And so while you had at the head of the Army, you had General Earl Grant Wheeler and uh, his co-worker Satanists like Matt Namara helping smuggle drugs on the West Coast, then you had Illuminati Grandmaster Leo Wheeler coordinating the drug running. Now let's go back to General Grant. Ulysses Grant was, as a boy, a very uh, unkempt, unpromising boy. Uh, he wasn't very intelligent, and nobody could think of um, anything for his future. He was unpromising. But his father had connections, so he got him an appointment to West Point. The town that General Grant came from, Georgetown, had a lot of political pull behind it. There were, at the outbreak of the Civil War, four generals in the Union Army from Georgetown and one colonel. And then in the volunteer units that Lincoln raised, 
there were nine more generals from that little village of barely a thousand people. And all in all, you had 20 leading Union uh, officers from this little village. Now, General Grant himself, he entered the Union Army on April 23, 1861, as a private. And on August 7, 1864, he was made supreme commander over all the Union forces. And that was antedated back to May 17, 1864. So from April of 61 to May of 64, three years, he went from being a private to commander-in-chief of the entire Union Army. Later, he became president. So this man, who was a gutter drunk when the Civil War broke out, became president, and he selected eight Masons as his cabinet, and one of the men on his cabinet was Columbus Delano of the ancient aristocratic black noble family Delano. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt is a descendant of that uh, same Delano family. And there was another man on Grant's cabinet that was Alfonso Taft, who was the blood forth father of Bill Clinton. And uh, Grant selected as his advisor Jonas Mills Bundy of the Bundy Illuminati family. And uh, Jonas uh, Bundy was also the advisor to the next two presidents. And uh, if we come forward in time, we'll see that McGeorge Bundy was the advisor of the uh, President Kennedy and Johnson, and Harvey Bundy, also of the Bundy Illuminati family, was head over the Manhattan Project. Now let's look at Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln's mother, Nancy Hanks, was uh, um, visiting Lincolnton, North Carolina, when she was impregnated by A. A. Springs. A. A. Springs was a descendant of the Rothschilds. And the Springs had changed their name from Springstein to ch hide their genealogy, to hide their Rothschild blood. Now, this man here, Leroy Springs, was Abraham Lincoln's half-brother, and he worked for Louis Cass Pazur, who was one of the most powerful men in the United States of his time. His descendants are still very powerful and are still unknown. He was of the Merovingian dynasty, the 13th Illuminati bloodline. <clears throat> In fact, it was the Pazur family that owned Jekyll Island, where they created the Federal Reserve. Now, uh, Abraham Lincoln uh, became the top Rosicrucian in the United States, and he was a member of the Order of the Lily, which uses the fleur de lis as its logo, which is the Merovingian logo. And he married a Todd. Remember I told you that the Todd family was a branch from the Collins family. And she conducted uh, rituals, seances, in the White House, which Lincoln sometimes participated in. And he, Abraham Lincoln, as president, selected as his attorney Bart Moore of the Bietti Illuminati family. And a descendant from that Bietti Illuminati family is Shirley MacLaine. Salmon P. Chase was made his Secretary of Treasury. Now, if you look on the $10,000 bill, the highest denomination, you'll see Salmon P. Chase's uh, picture. And uh, Chase Manhattan, of which the Rockefellers are associated with, was named after Salmon P. Chase. Salmon P. Chase, while he was a Secretary for Lincoln, introduced a national bank and graduated income tax for us which is what Karl Marx had been advocating in his writing. And Lincoln's uh, cabinet uh, got involved with an Illuminati European country, a company called the Credit Mobilier, which was uh, a scamming to uh, the American people. And a scandal broke out, and the American people found out that Lincoln's cabinet had uh, scammed them out of $23 million. Now, Lincoln had was having a sexual liaison with King Leopold's daughter, and he had a set of twins, Ella and Emily. That doesn't mean that Lincoln was necessarily promiscuous, but you will find in a lot of these high-level Illuminati families that they have a lot of secret offspring. And one last note about General Grant. He was best of friends with 
the Chinese uh, Li family, General Li of the Li Chinese family, was best of friends with General Grant. And then he, in turn, uh, General Li, who was known as the Bismarck of the East, was best of friends with the German Ill Illuminati Krupp family. you very much too. It's very encouraging to me to see so many Americans coming out who love their country and love the truth. We have a lot of good information and uh, this next uh, part of the talk is going to be some of the most difficult information. Now, our prominent bloodlines of the mystery religions, they keep their power and wealth by dynastic intermarriage. They maintain as low of a profile as possible, and they use fronts for legitimacy. Here are some of uh, the information on the Collins. The Rothschild family, for instance, have their own secret genealogies, which go clear back to Nimrod. Now, who is Nimrod? Nimrod was a great warrior. And remember, we talked about the power of Gnostic religions. And he realized, as a warrior, that he could take the power of the state and combine it with the power of Gnostic religion. And you see an example of that Babylonian system during the Middle Ages, where the Catholic Church was married to the state. Not all of us, though, can belong to one of these powerful bloodlines. So, so they have a game here that we can play so we can participate in the type of games they play. And it was kind of interesting that this game has cards that represent the different things that you are to uh, control to win the game. And these are uh, a few of the cards of the game, and they are also the type of things that the Illuminati controls. Those of you who uh, want to understand this further uh, can, uh, can look at it on your own. Now, the United States military has a lot of handbooks. This is a handbook for chaplains. It explains those religious groups that are recognized by the United States military. And in this book are a number of witchcraft organizations, including the Church of Satan. And in this handbook, it explains that within witchcraft, there are three degrees, which is correct. If we look at this diagram, we will see the basic structure of the secret Illuminati. Back in 1776, they structured the Illuminati with, the, with 13 positions. But around the time of the American Civil War, they restructured it somewhat so that what they created was this first level, your anarchy level here, and then a hierarchy level, and then your special committees and councils. <coughs> this is very similar to <coughs> this is, excuse me. 
This is very similar to what we saw on our diagram where you had your, uh, remember on your Gnostic religions, where you had your broad mass religions and your initiate group. On the anarchy level, you'll find thousands of different witchcraft groups that each have their own rituals and their own beliefs, and they look disassociated and unorganized uh, and unrelated. But then, if you are selected to go beyond that, you will enter the hierarchy level, and as a little girl, for instance, you would be part of Sisters of Light, and then as a teenager, you'd be inducted into the Mothers of Darkness, and then you would progress to the grandmother level. And they have many special commit <coughs> committees and councils. For instance, your council of three, five, seven, eleven, thirteen, your grand druid council, your committee of three hundred, your committee of five hundred. Over here, you see represented again that same pa three tiered pattern that I was talking about. And this is the Satanic Brotherhood, uh, which is organized in hubs. The Satanic Brotherhood and the Illuminati are like this. They're essentially one organization, <clears throat> except the Illuminati is technically Gnostic dualism. They believe that your good deeds must balance your bad deeds. If you were to uh, follow the life of somebody that was um, inducted through one of the Illuminati orders, like the Order of the Skull and Bones, you'll see that they are tapped as a candidate for first year or night, and a patriarch may, and may rise to leadership within the Skull and Bones. From there, you'll see that they progress to the Council of Foreign Relations, whose equivalent is the Royal Institute of International Affairs, then to the Round Table Groups, and then to the Pilgrim Society. The Pilgrim Society is far more powerful than Council of Foreign Relations, although very few people know about it and talk about it. And this is your OTO. Now this is a very important scripture to share with you. It says, and upon her head was written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and the abominations of the earth. I'm just going to go through this as quick as I can. Babylon the Great is fallen. It's become the habitations of devils and the hold of every foul spirit. All nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And it goes on to talk about her slaves and how she sells the souls of men. And it says, <clears throat> by thy sorceries were all nations deceived, and in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. I want to draw out two points from this. Now, the popular Protestant interpretation of this set of scriptures is that this is referring to the Catholic Church. Ladies and gentlemen, the Catholic Church wasn't even in existence when most of the prophets, the biblical prophets, were slain. This is referring to Babylon the Great, Babylon the Mystery Religions, which is today the Illuminati. And I also point out to you that uh, there it says, all that were slain upon the earth. So God is a greater conspiratorialist than I am. He's laying at the feet of this one organization, the Mystery Religions, all the blood of all of all of these innocent people down through the years. It's very interesting when you're a researcher like myself and you go in and see how all these wars were created for the powerful elite and all of their assassination squads and everything. I have a better understanding for why God said all that were slain upon the earth are the fault of this mother of harlots. So the Catholic Church is a daughter of the harlot. We're not talking about a Jewish conspiracy. We're not talking about a Catholic conspiracy. We're talking about a conspiracy that involves all the nations of the earth. <clears throat> and in the Scottish Rites Journal of this year, they talk about the double eagle. Now, this is a logo 
that comes from Babylon. And many countries around the world have adopted it. And these are a few of the countries over here that have adopted it. You've got Israel and Mexico and France and Germany and Turkey and Bolivia and Chile and Honduras and Italy and another country that has adopted it that's not uh, given there is Canada. <coughs> and this real quickly, I'm going to go through the next th through a few pieces of documentation very quickly. Try to hold it here for just a few uh, second so that they can uh, zero in on it. But it's telling us, this is, comes from the Talmud, that the Talmud comes from Babylon. <coughs> and this, from the Jewish Encyclopedia, is telling us how uh, the uh, uh, Pharisees learned their beliefs from Babylon. What happened was, is that during the captivity, the mystery religions created a branch of themselves, the Pharisees. And in this next uh, item, which comes from the Jewish Encyclopedia, it teaches us that the Pharisees, which was a branch of the mystery religions, then took over the life of the uh, Jewish people and and it says, Phariseeism shaped the character of Judaism and the life and thought of the Jew for all the future. They're, they're known as rabbis. And this uh, piece of documentation is just telling us that the Talmud ranks above the Torah. What's the Torah? First few books of the Bible. And this is very similar to what's happened in... Uh, the Catholic system where the, the Pope's traditions have become more important than the Bible itself. <coughs> and this article was written for, uh, to be sent out around the world. It was the Jewish Post International Edition. And this is an article by a rabbi, and I won't read it due to time, but he says that if you were born Jewish, you are divine. And this is from an another recent Jewish magazine. It's advertising amulets of protection for one's home or office. Now, back in Frankfurt, Germany, there was a family named Bauer, and they had this hexagram amulet on a red sign to protect their house, and they were named after this sign. In German, this red sign, Rothschild, um, uh, was given to the, uh, the family, and that's how the Rothschilds were named. When I went in and looked at what was going on, I found that, uh, surprisingly, there was a strong, uh, there was just as strong a Scottish contingency in the Illuminati as your Jewish con contingency, and uh, I don't have time to go through all the names here on this clan map of Scotland, but you'll see the Kennedys, which is a top 13 Illuminati bloodline. You'll find the Stewarts, who are good friends with the Rockefellers. You'll find the Morgans up here, for instance, who hasn't heard of Morgan Guarantee, and here are the Sinclairs. They were given a hereditary uh, and, um, leadership of Freemasonry and are members of the top 13, uh, the top 13th Illuminati bloodline, the Merovingian Holy Bloodline. Throughout the world, Satan's empire is built on Gnostic knowledge. Okay, Gnostic knowledge is hidden knowledge. There are three words: occult. Arcane and esoteric, all three mean hidden. That is the type of knowledge that these groups claim to have because it gives them an instant power base. And this is the key to seeing Satan's worship around the world. These are five interlocked concepts. This is the key, and I won't go into it in detail, but now you know that there is a key to unlock 
to see that hidden underneath all these different uh, religious worships around the world is uh, satanic worship. <clears throat> this is the caduceus. The Illuminati are Gnostics that have a dualistic belief of balancing their good deeds with their bad deeds. That's why some of the greatest philanthropists are also some of the, the uh, biggest Illuminati Satanists. A lot of their good deeds, though, are self-serving. And the caduceus is found in China, India, and other places in the world. A lot of people don't believe that there's such a thing as satanic ritual abuse. So I got this. This was in a museum. And as is typical of, uh, uh, of Illuminati oaths, <clears throat> they sign them in blood. And this is an oath to Satan to give you my body and soul in my life. And this was a extremely secret Illuminati castle until I began this circuit. This, ca this is the gate, the entrance to a lane that leads to the castle. This castle is near the town of Muno, and it's near the fr French border. It's in Belgium. And the town of Muno is rather strange in itself because the village is connected to the people that run this castle. This castle is used for high-level Mother of Darkness rituals. And when you go down the lane and you go through these huge big doors, and we're not going to describe it all in detail, but anyway, you come to a, a cathedral, you know, a church within this, this castle, and in the ceiling is a thousand points of light. Now you know what George Bush and some of these others are referring to cryptically when they say a thousand points of light. And down in the secret basement of this castle, hidden down there on a daily basis, they take a pregnant woman and they sacrifice her and they take the baby and they sacrifice it and drain the innocent blood from the baby and use that as ink to write in this great white book the deeds that were accomplished that day in bringing in Satan's reign of the Antichrist. <clears throat> now you'll notice it, it, perhaps that right here, the Abbey du Orval, that is a very significant abbey for the Merovingian dynasty. And it's only about four or five miles uh, from the castle. And it was in this area that King Dagobert of the Merovingians was, uh, was assassinated. We'll see a skull later. The Illuminati adepts learn they do pathworking of the Kabbalah. They also go through different occult sciences. Last one being uh, vampirism, which is called the Holy Grail. And this is why uh, you will see these top Illuminati men addicted to blood. Uh, when someone is being sacrificed, ladies and gentlemen, which is a very horrible thing, the person is terrified and adrenaline is pumped into their body. <clears throat> when you drink that blood, you get the high, the adrenaline high that that person was in. And you, after a while, become addicted to that adrenaline high. There's also a very top secret this substance, it's called adrenal chrome, and the, just the very existence of it's been kept very secret by these people. If you time things just perfectly right, as the person is being sacrificed, you can stick a needle here at the base of the skull, and if you know what you, you're doing and the timing is correct, you can extract adrenal chrome, which is a very valuable drug, natural drug, on the Illuminati's black market. <clears throat> this is why <clears throat> uh, you will see that, uh, <clears throat> well, backtracking just a little bit, the establishment news media said that the reason why Al Gore carried blood in a suitcase was that he was a hemophiliac. But the truth of the matter is that he's become addicted to blood. <clears throat> and now we're going to uh, discuss 
very briefly with you. I can get my pen. Point. We're going to discuss very briefly with you the uh, basic policy process within the United States. Of course, as you can see, it's not what the people think it is. We're going to go through this very quickly. This is worthy of maybe a few books. Here at the top, on the international level, on the top satanic levels, decisions are being made. Those decisions are being passed down to <clears throat> the national level. If you go back in the occult world, you'll read uh, a man named Plato, and he talks about the wise men ruling. That occult concept was passed on down, and you'll read in Francis Bacon's book, The New Atlantis, which originally had a title with the words, uh, a word of Rosicrucian, that they wanted to create a group of wise men to rule in the new world, and that concept has indeed been implemented. <clears throat> that study group or wise men group is called Majesty 12, and it's been given a lot of code names. They just sometimes just seem to happen to meet each other. And originally it was set up six men from the executive committee of the Jason Society, six men of the executive committee of the Jason Group, and six men of other key positions along with the chairman, and I believe in Reagan's administration, they upped the number to 40. And this group, on their classified pa papers, has the word MAGIC, M-A-J-I-C, stamped on it. But they can't make all the decisions. So they pass some of the decisions on to the policy planning groups, which I've listed over here, the Council of Foreign Relations, the Trilateral Commission, the Brookings Institute, the Business Roundtable, the American Enterprise Institute, the Population Council, Resources for the Future, and the Urban Institute. But those people can't make all the decisions, so they pass them on down the line, some of them on down the line, to the research policy planning groups, such as the RAND Corporation, the Stanford Research Institute, and the Hudson Institute. Now, how does this work in actuality? Let's say the Illuminati have made a decision as to something they want to implement. They'll get somebody, say the president does announce, we have a problem. Then they, the president will say, we have a problem. We need to initiate a government study of this problem. And then they will pour millions of dollars into a government study and maybe after 10 years come up with a large number of findings that are pr printed in these thick books that even researchers like myself don't wade through. And the bottom line is the decision that they had decided upon long ago. And then they get their opinion makers, government councils, national uh, uh, news medias, and intelligence agencies to help them out to make it appear like there's grassroots support at different levels. And so the legislators say, we had this problem, we did this study, this is the best advice, and they pass a law. Now, if they have any problems along the way, they have their covert enforcers, like the mafia and the IRS and FBI and ADL, to smooth out the opposition. <coughs> Hidden behind the scenes, the Illuminati have created occult area boards in all the areas. Of course, you got your four regions with 13 states each, and then within each of those, you've got a small section that's uh, given an occult area board, all your different groups working within a given area. If they're working, collaborating with the Illuminati, will send participants or representatives. So as an example of how this works, your own cult in Japan, the Illuminati uh, area board over there uh, decided, let's build up the own cult. They pull recruit, or they pull people from other cults into the ohm, ohm cult to build it up. <clears throat> then when they wanted to make regional government for the United States, what pattern did they follow? Their area boards. There's <clears throat> a twilight world of the interconnections between organized crime and the Illuminati. As you'll notice, some of the Mishpuka and the Triad and the Mafia and the P2 Freemason families are, are tied in bloodwise 
family-wise with the Illuminati. But the whole thing is one slimy mess that interconnects. And this one I won't show, but it's, uh, it, it's just on the Illuminati control of health care. We don't have time to go into that. I'll let you glance at this uh, next one here for a minute. Uh, I knew I was going to be coming to the Midwest, and I knew that there were a lot of uh, good farm people. And uh, I have a monograph that explains this particular um, uh, transparency in case you want more information. And you can get this through Prophecy Club. This is Illuminati and mob control of Hollywood. And of course, you'll notice that very important part of that was Music Corporation of America who got sweetheart deals from these groups here. They're go through and look at who's in charge of things, you'll find lots of Illuminati names. And this is Federal Reserve, and you'll notice very nice, uh, and nice, that's not a nice word to use here, but at any rate, you'll notice Illuminati names, Rockefeller, Russell, Peabody, Reynolds, Warburg, Pine, Morgan, as original stockholders of the Federal Reserve. This was in my book, Be Wise as Serpents. And I went into detail about how these different components control Christianity. For instance, I went denomination by denomination and gave high-ranking Freemasons who were important clergymen in these denominations. For instance, for the Episcopal Church, this was uh, the list of Freemasons within the Episcopal Church. And here is an example of how Christians are using a Masonic Lodge as a church. Joseph Smith, Jr. created Mormonism. Here are some of his magic amulets that he used. Here's his serpent staff that he used. Here's his ritual athema that he used. Joseph Smith, Jr. came from an important occult bloodline all of the leaders of the RLDS Church and the LDS Church have been members of the same bloodline. They go back to the tribe of Dan and, and uh, the Merovingians, and uh, I believe that Gordon P. Uh, B. Hinckley, who is now leader of the LDS Church, goes back to the Merovingians via Nathaniel uh, Hinckley, uh, who's tied back into the Plantagenet family. And uh, here's some more. This is a green seer stone of Joseph Smith, Jr. and some of his magic parchment. And his successor of the main group, uh, Brigham Young, here is his Masonic pen. And that's Dagward's skull. And that was one of the leaders of the uh, Merovingian Priory of Zion. Now, the man who started the Jehovah's Witnesses, Charles Taze Russell, was a Knights Templar Freemason. And as you can read here, Charles Taze Russell, ritually murdered by the Illuminati on Halloween, has his ashes protected below a pink granite pyramid made from the sacred enchanted rock mountain at a sacred site 18 miles north of Fredericksburg, Texas. The pyramid is in a cemetery in what was Allegheny, Pennsylvania, now Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Real quickly, here are some actual members of the Illuminati from these various bloodlines. John Jacob Astor, for instance, within a matter of a few years, had a monopoly on the entire fur trade. And if you stop to think about it, the fur trade had been going on for centuries before he arrived. And here's some uh, Illuminati from the DuPont family. The DuPonts are um, key people in the military industrial complex. Every day, each one of us cannot escape using something made from chemical products that the DuPonts are involved with. They also have been major manufacturers of American gunpowder for our different wars. And this is the Freeman Illuminati family. Gaylord Freeman 
in charge of the Priory of Zion for a while, and he was advisor to two presidents, so was Roger A. Freeman, and here's one of the Freeman in the skull and bones. And this is the Kennedys, JFK's sister married into British royalty. Joseph Kennedy once remarked on one of the marriages that didn't go through, if my daughter had married, my son-in-law would have been the head of all Freemasons. And here's JFK making his pilgrimage to the pyramids, just like Grant made a pilgrim, Ulysses Grant made a pilgrimage to the pyramids, and so did uh, Charles Taze Russell and many of the others. This is what we're going to discuss about uh, in depth. Uh, this woman here, Marilyn Monroe, was the first uh, presidential sex model slave that they allowed the public to see. I believe in these pictures here, we're watching her switch personalities. James Manfield, who was under mind control, uh, she was a, um, one of uh, JFK's girlfriends and she's a member of LaVey's Church of Satan, and uh, Sammy Davis Jr. was also under LaVey's control, a member of a Church of Satan, and also a good friend of JFK. Here's Lee ka uh Illuminati billionaire in Hong Kong, who has quite a bit of things in uh, Canada. And here is Winthrop Rockefeller. He supplied money to finance Clinton. He is reported to have the world's largest porn collection. And here's Guy de Rothschild, who uh, in, in French we might say Gita. And I believe that this man is, is uh, probably the father of either the Antichrist or the Antichrist John the Baptist. And this is his son David over here in one of their mansions. And here is Billy. And this sign using the left hand, this for some people could mean I love you, a sign with the left hand, sign of Satan, but it's got a more significant uh, meaning. This is ha one of the ways that they uh, induct people into trance who are slaves. And then here, Adolf Hitler and his grandmother. His grandmother was impregnated by the Rothschilds in Vienna. And then Hitler's father was paid money to change his name from Schickelgruber to Hitler. Now we're going to talk about the mind control. And you will notice that I saved this for last. I realized that even if I spent all three hours on this topic, I could barely scratch the surface and I was very reluctant to open up this Pandora's box um, and, and oh, start talking about something that's so vast and complex a subject that I can barely pull the pieces together to make it a coherent subject for you without raising a lot more questions. But recently there's been a number of books come out on the mind control, but most of them are very superficial. You really want to get this to understand it better. Someone who got this uh, said, Fritz, after I got this, I was so excited about the subject, and I got a whole bunch of other books on the subject, and they all turned out to be vague. And I said, yes, I know that's the case. And another uh, uh, illustration about this book is somebody who came in off the streets who knew nothing about anything and was a teenager, picked this up and couldn't put it down and 20 pages later had to be torn from it. <clears throat> now, you may be wondering, how do they do this mind control? Well, the book will explain it. That's why I wrote the book. I can't go into the details of how they do this mind control. But I can say simply that it is a very sophisticated combination of every mind control technique that has ever been thought up. Okay, now if you talk 
or listen to someone in the CIA, sometimes you will hear them say, well, we tried behavioral modification, but it only works in such a percentage of the cases. And we tried this method of mind control, but it only works in a small percentage of the cases. And we tried this. and They make it appear like they've discarded all of these. The truth is, is if you uh, t uh, take this method of mind control, which only works, let's say, in 70% of the cases, and, th and match it to, uh, to this type of mind control, which only works in 70% of the cases, and match it to this, and make a group package, by the time you've gone through all these many different types of mind control, you create something that totally locks the person into your control. This is my co-author. <clears throat> now, when they begin with a child, they uh, start traumatizing it. The human mind is like a computer. You've probably heard uh, people say that the, compu uh, the human mind is like a computer and that if you've got all of the computers in the world and put them together, then in some functions, the human mind would outstrip it. In order to make computers functional, they had to learn how to section off memory. When you reboot your computer, there's memory there that you can't touch. The Illuminati learned centuries ago how to section off memory within the human mind. And it's done with amnesia walls. And the amnesia walls are built by trauma. If you look at a timeline here, and here's a point in time when, let's say, you're in war and your buddy gets killed and it's a trauma to you, you may take and build amnesia walls around that particular event in your mind. That's called post-traumatic stress syndrome. The Illuminati learned this trick many centuries ago, and they traumatize a person until they shatter their mind into thousands upon thousands of disassociated states. Okay, it's like taking a mirror and throwing it against the ground and breaking it into thousands of pieces. And then they know how to go in and find each of those little pieces and with that little disassociated part of mind, or memory, they, they, through programming, build that, each piece, into what they want. Perhaps they want that piece to be a personality. Then they will give that piece of the mind an identity, a history, um, a job, and the full works. And they'll also attach a hypnotic cue that they can pull that peace of mind, that alter, that personality, they're called alters or personalities, so that they can pull that to the front of the mind. Then they build very complex alter systems. My co-author here, her mind was shattered 30,000 ways, and then to build an alter system, the front of her alter system had 13 by 13 grid, which is 169 personalities. And then there were 13 sections of that. And all of these have amnesia walls between them and all have uh, 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 hypnotic cues attached to pull them to the minds. That's just a small part of her system. There are many hidden worlds as she had two programmers competing against each other for control of her and putting in hidden worlds. And basically what you have with these people is they've made a mess of their minds They've shattered them into many pieces, and they've tried to scrape up a few things and uh, pull together this mess. So you have, like, if you're comparing this to a store, you've got a nice storefront, but if you go out behind the store, there's a lot of garbage out there and a big mess. They like to create the best fronts for these systems of altars. They like to hide what they're doing. They like to give them, they like to create a personality or several personalities to hold the body that have the most legitimate, the best front that they can imagine. So I like to ask audiences, what do you think the favorite occupation is for men in the Illuminati? And very often times they say things like judges, lawyers, politicians. No, people. 
the favorite occupation is being Christian clergyman because that's the best front. In fact, her father was a Christian clergyman. Uh, he was also Leo Wheeler, a programmer. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, here's another transparency. This, was, uh, this came in color from Bethesda, which is one of the places that they program with. And what this is showing here, although this, uh, in this copy it's black and white, is that the mind of a multiple personality is different than someone who doesn't have MPD. If I was to act like a different person and they took a PT scan of my brain, it would look the same every time. But when they switch personalities, they switch alters, the brain PT scans are vastly different, thus proving that their brains are not the same. They do other things to these people too, like they want to get a photographic memory. You electronically scar the brain stem and that creates um, in the child a photographic memory before you then begin dividing their personalities and you get a system of multiple personalities with photographic memories. MPD has recently been renamed DID, Dissociative Identity Disorder. <coughs> What are the ramifications of what they're doing? Well, there's other countries that do mind control programming beside the United States. If we look at where immigrants are coming into the United States from, we find that the former Soviet Union is second in the list, and then Red China third, and then Vietnam fifth down here are the top six countries sending us people. Three of them are these communist countries that are involved in mind control. I wonder how many Spetsnaz agents have in, been infiltrated in from the Soviet Union. This is how to make the perfect spy or the perfect assassin. Remember I said we create the perfect front. Okay, let's say, say we're going to create an assassin. Where would be the perfect front for an assassin? The group that's most widely known, publicized as being a pacifist group, are the Amish. So by various means, which we won't go into, they manage to infiltrate the Amish. Remember, the Amish were required to send their boys to do alternative service during the various wars, and they did, some of them did that in mental hospitals where they do this mind control programming. And so, if we are going to uh, use this Amish farm boy as an assassin, we, uh, I'm saying we as, as if we were in the position of the people that use these slaves, these mind-controlled slaves, we would uh, trigger them somehow on a subconscious level uh, for the boy to go on a trip to visit his Freundschaft, his relatives in another state. And as he's traveling, say for instance, maybe he comes on the bus to a, a, a stop and he gets off and goes into the restroom and he's programmed to go through a series of things which just click him into his assassination uh, altar and he goes out and carries out his mission, his assassination, then he gets on the bus, goes and visits his relatives and comes back. All he knows that he's done is he's visited his relatives. There's a thing called backup amnesia. You forget that you forgot. He doesn't even realize that he's lost time. When, the, when this is all done, then the CIA, um, and they call this a wet ops, that's their term for blood's going to run, they will debrief this wet ops uh, with a team of three, a programmer and a polygraph, an expert and one other guy, and they'll bring him, the, the boy in. They will query the alters involved, find out what the truth of the matter is during this action, and then when they're satisfied that they know what's happened, they'll place the boy back into the Amish community. I sat and watched them do this mind control with many people right in front of uh, many 
uh, unsuspecting people. They say the codes, they program people and everything, and the people around them don't even know what's going on. It, once you get the programming set into a person by the time they're a teenager, then in 15 minutes in a back room, you can program them for a mission. So it doesn't take a whole lot of time. Perhaps somebody goes into a restroom, perhaps somebody gets a phone call or something like this, and you can program them very quickly to do something. You saw uh, how this operates if you've seen the Charles Bronson movie Telephone. And there they make this out in the movie Telephone to be something that the Russians have done. And there's this Russian agent, he's going around the United States, and he calls people up on the phone, for instance, a housewife, and he says a little ditty, like a nursery rhyme, and it triggers her to go into her disassociative state, another altar that's programmed to go and get in the car and blow up a military installation and suicide herself. Now you know what's happening with all these people that are going in and shooting up things and turning the guns on themselves. These are mind-controlled people. Unfortunately, we have about two million, that's a conservative estimate, about two million Americans are under this total mind control. People, everything that you thought you knew about people is obsolete. And this is very difficult for us to grasp. It's what the New Agers call a paradigm shift. And everything that we have been using to judge other people has been obsolete even before we were born. We go into a church and we use as a litmus test as to whether the preacher is legitimate, is he preaching the word of God? Unless we could follow that preacher around 24 hours a day, unless we knew the hand signals and some of the other things, we could not get a handle on what that minister was all about. This programming has a very sophisticated way uh, of making people have a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde effect. And they don't even know that they're controlled. It's undetectable even to the person who's under the mind control. I have a friend who was a Christian minister. He had Collins blood and Rothschild blood in him and then he was adopted into a Russell family to hide his lineages. And horrors of horrors. Imagine being a very devout Christian, like so many of us are in this room, and he was, and then he finds out that there's a dark side to him that's totally different, that's part of the Illuminati and their horrific rituals. Some people, when they're faced with this, the Christian part of them wants to go into denial about uh, what's going on in their life. Here I am at one of the places they do a lot of programming, the Presidio. And this is real close to Presidio, Palace of Fine Arts where the Illuminati do rituals. And here we find that the Sixth Army is headquartered at the Presidio and their logo is the hexagram in a circle with the satanic uh, anarchy A in it. If you know some of the leadership of the Sixth Army, you're not surprised at, at their logo. Quite a number of Satanists in their officer corps, including this fellow here, Michael Aquino, who's the son of Betty Ford, and he's the head of the Church of Set, and he has a number of his high priests in his Church of Set who are also part of the Sixth Army. I think about a dozen of them are high up in military intelligence with, with high security clearances. They do a lot of mind control in the Temple of Set. This is another place that they do programming. This is in the United Kingdom, Tavistock Clinic. <clears throat> now, some people have wondered, why is it that I am not giving you solutions to all of this? And the reason why is, is that this is extremely sophisticated and before you know what the problem is, I can't give you the answer. You need to know what the problem is. You need to know what's going on. And I believe that once we start seeing what's happening, then the solutions to this will start appearing. However, I can tell you 
that when I started working with people that were in the Illuminati, that wanted out, that were wanting to, sh that were sharing information in with me and everything, I thought at the time that the therapists were taking care of them. And then I began to realize that what was happening was, is that hundreds of thousands of these mind-controlled slaves were going into therapists for various reasons, and uh, the therapist that knew something would begin to start working with some, some of the multiplicity in their minds. And the therapist would work they, uh, like one hour a week with these people and charge them maybe 100 or $200 for that hour. And they would tell these victims of mind control that they were getting better. These people thought well, this is great. I'm getting better. The therapist liked it because they were supporting themselves. They were making good money. And the Illuminati was liking it, too, because they were continuing to use these slaves. And I was looking at this situation and going, what's wrong with this? And so that's why I dived in where angels fear to tread and started working with a lot of these mind-controlled victims. And I went through hell literally hell to get this information and to try to save some of these people. It's too big of a job for one person. It really is. What we need is people who understand what is going on and understand some of the solutions and so we can form teams of people to try to help these victims of mind control. They have tremendous needs in many different ways. <coughs> And people don't understand how sophisticated this is. In looking at how they have designed this mind control, the engineering and thinking that's gone into it, in my opinion, far surpasses what was put into the Apollo project. For everything that you're going to flippantly come up with, I'm sure that they have thought of at least a dozen, if, if not many more, ways to circumvent you uh, being able to undo the programming. For instance, many of the altars are dehumanized and told they don't have a heart. If you were to talk to that altar, or if you want to call it disassociative state, they think of themselves as a, a person with a personality. If you were to talk to that altar, they would tell you they don't have a heart. So if you tell them to give their heart to Jesus, that's not going to have any meaning. They have uh, them programmed so that if you quote scripture, you may very easily trigger a number of things to happen. One is, is that a deaf and dumb altar may take the body and they will not even hear you. Or if you're saying something like Jesus loves you, they have a scrambling altar that's programmed to take the body and that scrambling altar scrambles it so that uh, what they hear is, is Jesus hates you. So every time you say Jesus loves you, they hear Jesus hates you. I'm just giving you a tiny sampling of how sophisticated this programming really is. They've really out, Satan has really outdone himself. And they have a program for infiltrating the churches. And anyone who is a legitimate a Christian minister is going to be singled out and targeted. It's called the Black Widow Program. They have uh, these mind-controlled slaves that are taught in seduction and they come in and seduce a minister and then that minister will be blackmailed. Remember when uh, uh, Jimmy, um, J uh, no, uh, no, okay, and now I've got myself mixed up. Okay, but when he fell, uh, there were 200 ministers that called into Assembly of God headquarters after, after he fell the next week and reported to uh, headquarters that they also had the same problem. <clears throat> this uh, mind control is all around us and it's ruining everything that's of value and pure in this country. It's being used to dirty anything and it's also uh, everything that the American people are proud of is is actually being used for this mind control for instance Walt Disney Disneyland 
Disneyland, Disney World are great programming centers, great places for uh, Illuminati rituals, but uh, Disney movies, which people think are family movies, they have been some of the primary films used to program these mind control um, victims. <clears throat> the Wizard of Oz was one of the standard programming themes and, the, and Alice in Wonderland was another standard programming theme. And then you see sometime in the 70s or 80s that they started switching and started using more of the alien type themes for the mind control programming. So you started seeing Star Wars and Star Trek and the Star Trek spin-offs being used a lot for the mind control. That uh, gave them an advantage. Uh, how did it give them the advantage? Well, like in the Alice in Wonderland, your master sets, him up, sets himself up as the white rabbit. In The Wizard of Oz, he's the wizard. In this alien stuff, the programmer pretends to the poor victim who's drugged and under hypnosis and being tortured that he is an alien, perhaps from a race that's far advanced of ours. I went through and tried to understand the encounters of the third kind. And uh, I interviewed people that had been abducted by aliens. What I found was is that every one of them had this type of mind control. Some of them I couldn't tell them about it because as I've been trying to get across to you, if you start working with some of these people, it's a very delicate thing and you could trigger suicide programs. But this one gentleman who I visited with, he uh, told me how benevolent these aliens were that kept abducting him. And again, they looked like people. That's interesting. And he said that although he didn't want them to, they continued to um, rape him. Well, people... This isn't benevolence, this is abuse. Uh, Area 51 is being used to program a lot of people with uh, this alien programming. Uh, if you uh, set in a program, when you fly a helicopter to pick up a slave and you shine a light in his eyes, you can have him programmed to believe that that light is a UFO. So. That's one explanation for a lot of the um, alien phenomena and the encounters of the third kind. But I do have something that's a treat, something special to show you. I told you that you would get a surprise. And if you look on here, this isn't as easy as on the original, but you'll see reptilian eyes in each of these photos that were gotten from American magazines. And here, this is a little bit easier to see it here. See the reptilian eyes. I have met respectable observers, since, for instance, a Christian psychologist, a very elderly lady who I trust and respect, and she has seen someone with reptilian eyes. Here again is this picture again with reptilian eyes. And if you want to know the rest of the story, you need to invite me back again. <laughs> That's like the lady who told the stories in Arabia. The, uh, <clears throat> the mind control uh, was uh, used during the 50s. It was, uh, they, they got the sophistication down for doing it to an individual. So you'll see that in the 1960s, groups like the CIA began shifting the emphasis of things into learning how to do, they infiltrated the different cults, like you have Jim Jones and the Branch Davidian, um, 
that, there were many Branch Davidians and they infiltrated one group of the Branch Davidians at Waco with seven of their mind-controlled slaves um, like David Koresh. And uh, then they began using uh, and uh, testing group mind control. Now it's been asked of me <clears throat> if I wouldn't talk some about current events. This is uh, something special being done for this group, but the other groups prior to this were very hungry for current events, and my talk was actually geared towards uh, these restricted subjects that we have talked about already but you're going to be given something special here. And I've written down just a few notes here that I'm talking off of the top of my head. This is not something that I had planned to talk on, so I'm just talking off of the top of my head. These are some of their plans for the future. The, if we look at Albert Pike, we'll find that he talked about three world wars that would be created to uh, bring in the New World Order. We have a nuclear war planned. If you look at what FEMA is setting themselves up for, about 80% of their activity and money is going into preparing for a nuclear war. And you know that FEMA must have the inside story on what's happening. Uh, if we go back in the occult world to St. Simon and his disciples, and this ties back in with the Illuminati, but his disciples published back around the, the uh, 1810 uh, plans to bring in a new world order. And they listed a number of things back at that point in time that needed to happen for a new world order to occur. They needed to build uh, a canal at, uh, that became the Suez Canal. They needed to build a canal in the Panama Isthmus to connect uh, Caribbean and the Pacific. There was a, they needed to make the countries interdependent, which is something that H.G. Wells and his New World Order also spelled out, and they have done that. And then one of a long list of things that they laid out in their plans for the New World Order there, clear back 200 years ago, was the creation of an androgynous being. They have been, they have accomplished creating androgynous beings. Another thing that they have planned for us, and I have warned the Christian people, is that one of the uh, cards that, that uh, Christianity holds that they offer people is everlasting life. Imagine if Satan could offer people everlasting life. Well, he has the, they have the ability to extend life, and they will play that card at some point, and even if they only prolong life several hundred years, you have to live several hundred years to find, find out that you don't have everlasting life, and it will devastate the membership of the Christian churches. Now, those of you who have, have read the report from Iron Mountain, you know that they uh, created three pseudo-wars as a substitute for an actual fighting war, and that those three wars are being implemented today to keep us in a state where they can uh, uh, have all kinds of laws to control us. And those three wars are the war on the environment, the war on drugs, and then, of course, their plans to create a mock alien invasion. I have uh, talked briefly on the radio for Prophecy Club about the flying saucers, somebody very high up in the New World Order who was brought to Christ by a close friend of mine has talked about piloting the flying saucers. Yes, the United States government has flying saucers. And uh, before he became a Christian, he considered that the beings that were co-piloting these flying saucers were aliens. But then when he became a Christian, he took a second look and realized these were demons. It's rather interesting. I have tape recordings of some of the aliens talking. They send shivers up my back. They sound exactly like I would imagine a demon to sound like. And what's further interesting 
is these people are saying, these aliens, that they have been around for something like a half a million years. And I'm thinking, when do we give these aliens resident status? <laughs> they have already moved a lot of uh, the first contingents of foreign troops into the United States. Some of you, I'm sure, have seen the maps where they, uh, that they came up with years ago where they had planned out which four nations would, uh, would send troops to what regions of the United States. They don't want Americans um, patrolling American regions for the New World Order. Why, they might be too loyal to their um, American civilians. They have uh, built a German air base in New Mexico that the Germans control. And here in Kansas, you will notice that uh, they have been training Russian police at Yoder, Kansas and that there have been large contingents uh, of Russian troops and, and military hardware that have been brought through the United States. Some of it stockpiled. Uh, one witness talked to me about the caves in Mexico, which had large stockpiles of Soviet weapons. And of course, then, is, are there plans, there are long-range plans of what they're going to do uh, with this planet and uh, eventually it seems like they want to and this is looking way into the future move things to Australia as the center of things if you will look at things right now the mother country of the Illuminati is England and the center of England is London but there are two different Londons. Maybe you are not familiar with that. <clears throat> there is a small enclave within Greater London, which is also called London, but it's the financial district, and it is called the city, okay? And it is a private enclave. And what is interesting about the city of London, which is controlled by the Illuminati, is that it sets where that financial district can have financial transactions because of the way the time zones are set all around the world within one day. It's the only location in the world where they can conduct from, from one particular point transactions with all the world's financial markets. And that has been, that area of the world has been like the center point for the Illuminati for a long time. But what I'm saying is, is eventually they hope to move that. And Denver and Atlanta are two of the cities that they have big plans for in the future. And uh, they also plan for some major developments in southern China to build it up. They also plan to uh, do a lot of activity with the asteroids, mining them, a lot of activity on Mars. Reality is far from what we have seen, people. And their technology is far beyond what they have allowed us to see. In fact, this ties back with the mind-controlled slaves. They are only releasing technology at a rate that they want to. Now, if you invent something that's way beyond its time to, for, and helpful for mankind, it will be suppressed. But one of the uh, mind-controlled slaves that I've spent time with, she was a uh, mind-controlled slave within the Watchtower Society, and she was programmed at a particular point in time to invent a particular invention. And then other people were programmed to form a company around that. Satan is a control freak, people. Things are not happening out of control. They can't. God works off of love, but Satan is, doesn't. Love doesn't seek its own. But Satan works off of hate. Everything in his world system has to be tightly controlled because he, he's trying to imitate God. He wants to be omnipresent and omnipotent. So he has all of these spy satellites in the world and all these spies on the, on, the, on the ground to try to control. He's a control freak. And everything in his world system seeks his own. It's all working towards these goals. And so what people see as random are actually working to very, are very specific 
and very controlled parts or elements of a plan. And I can guess I can get myself into more trouble on this videotape by talking about something that's controversial, the Mars colony, which has a uh, has slaves up there. That's their, they've already brought the New World Order um, into reality there on Mars. They haven't quite brought it into total fruition here on Earth. And in my 93 newsletters, I pointed out prior to the um, spacecraft that was to go there in 93, I gave a list of American and Russian spacecraft that had been sent to Mars. If you think back on things, if you're my age, you'll remember that when I was a child, the big issue was, is there life on Mars? Well, after sending many, many spacecraft to Mars, and some of these cost billions of dollars, scientists still tell us they don't know whether there's life on Mars. And if you look at that list, I listed the spacecraft that had gone to Mars, they all malfunctioned. Very strange. And so I told my, my readers in my newsletter in 93, I said, look at the past history of how all of these have malfunctioned or produced results that were of no significance. I said, the same thing will happen to this multi-billion dollar space probe. And when it did, people began to think, well, maybe Fritz is right. This is pretty amazing that he could predict that this space probe would have problems. Okay, we've got uh, three lists. Shall I go on? Okay, we've got three lists. Um, people have consistently asked me about the three lists, the red list, the blue list, the yellow list. One of my friends decided to follow the blue mar uh, uh, splotches, markers that they've put on these road signs, and strangely enough, it led them to a site that shouldn't have had Bob Dwyer, but it did and looked like it had been built for the purpose of being a concentration camp in the future. Yes, that's what these lists are all about. The red list will, will be, um, it's 187,000 uh, Americans, and the lists, which are on computers, have already been distributed and uh, perhaps the scenario that will happen uh, to round up people on the red list will go like this. And this comes from a man who, part of it comes, um, uh, the bulk of it comes from a man who was the inspector for the Joint Chiefs of Staff of these concentration camps. Uh, there may be a, an electrical blackout at night. If you have an electrical blackout, watch out. It might be a cover for them coming for the red list. And then people like these Russians who, who are hiding, they have these red, uh, the names. They will come at 4 a.m. just like they came at that time for Jesus. They'll pull you out of your house and they will, they will take you in a van, take you to like a cul-de-sac where a helicopter's flying in that are black. They're flying off of the their regular system navigation will take you to sites and then take you to locations where you will be terminated. Well, as we look at all of this prophecy coming to pass, we have to say, well, what really is the answer? I don't know about you, but I would like the rapture to have taken place about six minutes ago. But it didn't. And the reality is we don't really know. Prophecy is a very difficult thing because we're given a blessing if we try to figure it out. Revelations 1.3. But God also tells us that we see through a glass darkly. He doesn't give us all the pieces of the puzzle. So we stand in front of a puzzle trying to put all of the pieces together but we don't have all the pieces. We're given a reward to look, but we aren't given all the pieces. We don't know how they all fit together. So when we see these things that point to the fact that we truly are close to the end, 
See, folks have been saying for a long time, well, they've been saying for 2,000 years Jesus is going to come back. But today, with these kind of evidences, this kind of information, it shows us truly time is very short. What do we do? There are people that will tell you what you need to do is dig a hole in the side of the mountain and pull in the entrance. And I do believe God is telling some Christians to store nuts for the winter. And my answer to that is do as God tells you to do. But I can tell you that the physical preparations don't mean anything unless you've made the spiritual preparations. So the first question is, if the rapture hasn't happened, and we're going through trouble. If we're in a detention facility, if we find ourselves on a black helicopter, if we find ourselves in a soup line and there's no soup, if our electricity's been cut off, if our money's been cut off, shut up in a bank for six, six uh, months or so, how do we handle that? What do we do? What do we do when we're out of food? Well, first of all, we better have God's protection. We better have made some spiritual arrangements. So how do we get God's protection is the first question. Second question is, how do we get our name written in the book of life so we get to go to heaven when we do die? Well, first of all, how do we get God's protection? The only way God protects us is if we're clean, with no sin, no spot, no wrinkle. That's our objective in life. Now, how do we do that? First, we have to clean up. Well, the good news is that there's still detergent at the store, and the name is the blood of Jesus. First thing we have to realize is Revel er, Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We've all made a mistake. So if we're going to get our sins washed away, we have to realize that they're there. Next is we have to realize we can't earn it. Ephesians 2.8 and 9 says, For it is by grace you are saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift from God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now, if it's a gift, then how do we reach out and take that gift? How do we reach out and ask for our sins to be cleansed? Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, then thou shalt be saved. For the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We've simply got to say it and got to believe it. Acts 2, 38 says, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But what does that word repent? In my life, one day, having made a mess of it, I sat down and I said, God, I made a mess of my life. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a promise. I'll make you a deal. If you'll give me another chance, if you'll forgive my sins, if you'll wash me clean from here on out, I'm yours. I will do my best to follow your laws. I will read your book. I will see that I learn it. And from here on out, I'm yours. That's repenting. Holy Spirit, I ask you to go out and knock on the hearts of those people. Whose names you'd like to write into the book of life? Those people you'd like to wash clean so that you can save them and provide for them in the day of trouble, that they would make that decision this evening and also on the videotape in Jesus' name. Now, we've prayed this before. But let's all pray it again. Let's bow our head. No one looking around. Dear Heavenly Father, let's say it all together. Dear Heavenly Father, I admit I'm a sinner, and I confess with my mouth, and I believe in my heart that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, died on the cross, arose three days later, sits at the right hand of the Father, ask Him to forgive my sins, Write my name in the book of life. Save me in the day of trouble. And keep me holy. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to say it's all over just as simple as that. Now you can go on and live like the devil, but that's not what the Bible says. It's not that simple. Matthew seven twenty one says, Not everyone that cries, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but those that doeth the will of the Father. Jesus says, I am holy. Be ye holy, for I am holy. So we have to follow on to follow his laws. It's not over in another way because Matthew 10, 32 and 3 says, Whosoever confesses me before men, him will I also confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever denies me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Very serious. What's he saying? He wants us to say it in front of our other peers, friends, neighbors, relatives, coworkers, bosses. That's what he wants. 
not to embarrass you, but so you can fulfill Matthew 10, 32, and 3 in your life, so you have the opportunity to confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord. If you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you meant business with God, would you raise your hand, please? Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, if you prayed that prayer, rededicating your life, saying from here on out, I'm yours.